Ezekiel Kralin writes from San Francisco, and he put his address in one of his stories, and I looked it up on Google Earth and uh, and actually, you know, through my computer, virtually stood in the street in front of his building and turned around and looked at the buildings around there, and I have been there. That is, uh, that's an interesting thing that you can do now that you couldn't do in earlier times. I've actually been to that place with um, with Juanita. Of course, a lot of San Francisco looks alike to me, but uh, I'm pretty sure I've been there. And it's it's interesting to imagine um, Zeke up in one of those rooms in that building looking down. But he says that across the street, there is a coffee shop that he uses the Wi-Fi from by putting the antenna of his Wi-Fi gizmo attached to his computer in the window. And I can't really see a coffee shop across the street. And across the street is very far. I mean, there are many lanes. Uh, a couple of roads come together in a kind of diagonal. So it's, you know, it's several. It's like at least five lanes. Of, it's very far for Wi-Fi to work. So I'm not surprised it doesn't work very well, as he says. Anyway, he writes stories for me to read on my show, as you can, if you want me to read something that you've written. It doesn't have to be a story. It can be anything. Uh, email it to me, memo at mcn.org is my email address, m-e-m-o at mcn.org. And I'll read it on the very next memo of the year. If you send it from Ukiah, then uh, let me know in what you send so that I can read it after midnight when you can hear it on KMEC. So here is a story, the latest story that Ezekiel Kralin sent to me to read to you. The Screaming Machete. Ezekiel J. Kralin writes, Okay, as I promised, here is the second true horror story, even scarier than Skin in the Box, which also involves Don Waltz as the hapless messenger of evil tidings. Sometime in 1998 or 1999, it's well after sunset that Don buzzes my unit to bring me a, quote, gift and thought would make for a hilarious conversation piece. Why on earth he thought of me among all his many friends to be the recipient of such diabolical curio? is beyond my comprehension and must remain one of those secrets buried with him now that he has passed on. Personally, I believe he was paranormally seduced into delivering it unto my unsuspecting hands, for which reason will be clear as this tale progresses. So I pick up the phone. Yeah? It's me. I got something for you. Why on earth do my friends refuse to identify themselves? and assume I'll recognize their voice over this tinny intercom after I've told them time and time again to state their name. It's not like I don't have enemies who often force me to screen my calls. I ponder before replying, Well, who is it? Don, let me in. He responds, while well, chuckling like a demented crackhead, which he is not, though he does have his idiotic moments. So I press 9 on the dial pad, that he may open the gate and enter. Then I step into the hallway and await his ascent up the cheaply carpeted stairway, illuminated by dim 20-watt light bulbs that glare naked from brass chains which dangle from the 14-foot ceiling. My apartment building, 2306 Market, also called Dolores Apartments, was built in 1904 and is very much the haunted lair. Rumor has it that Anton LaVey, founder of the Church of Satan, once lived there in the turret. He appears holding some sort of machete. Uh, he, meaning Don, so, so to change direction very quickly there, he appears holding some sort of machete sheathed in leather with a handle that also appears to be leather, but is carved or shaped into some sort of face without any color other than desiccated cowhide. Upon closer inspection, the face appears to be a Mexican devil with a twisted grin. Its eyes seem to roll. I shudder. Once in my SRO, I withdraw the long curved knife from its sheath to discover a slightly rusted but still sharp machete with several splashes of dried blood on it. At least I think it's blood due to its dark maroon shade. Could be something else, though, but the overall impact is chilling, so I quickly place it back in the scabbard. I set it on desk number two. This is hideous. Don, where did you find it? In a dumpster by Dolores Park, he gloats. Well, it's a scary object... And I don't think I could live with this thing in the same room. No. But why don't you keep it overnight, he suggests. If you don't really want it, just pass it on to somebody who does, insists Don, who then says he got a split to pick up Babe from a friend's place. 
So I'm suddenly left alone in my dumpy hovel with a machete that grins evilly at me no matter where in the room I stand. I find it most unnerving and can't concentrate very well on my computer's BBS activities. Or television. Before hitting the sack, I decide to pull the ladder out from beside the fridge, climb it, and place the offending object on the loft, out of sight, out of mind, or so I believe. But once tucked cozily in my bedding, I drift into a most unsettling slumber. Dreams of a talking machete haunt my sleep. It jumps out of the sheath and lands on desk number three to chide me. Your enemies created me to slay you. Anyone who grabs my hilt will be suddenly compelled to slash you into many pieces. Then this devil hilt grins even wider and screeches an ultra-high pitch that can only be heard by my disturbed imagination. My eardrums feel as if punctured by sewing needles, and a chill sweat drenches the two comforters meant to keep me warm on icy nights. I awake many times through the damp wee hours, looking up at the loft in fear that the machete will suddenly leap upon my bed and slit my throat. Morning arrives, at last, and I fix a quick breakfast of rolled oats and raisins, then depart for Muddy Waters Coffee House on Church Street with this strange knife sheathed and secured in my backpack. After ordering a mocha latte and lemon bar, I notice Topaz, seated four tables away. He's a recent acquaintance I first met some weeks back at this venue. Has an anteater nose, thick framed glasses, and long straggly hair that falls well below the shoulders, no muscle tone whatsoever, just a flabby geek between the age of 24 and 32. So I decide to show him the machete, rise from my chair, and approach him. Hello, Paz, may I sit down? Sure, he invites. What's up, Zeke? I then tell him of the extraordinary item I received last night from a street buddy, and would he like to check it out? Only please... Don't remove the blade from its sheath, I instruct, then withdraw the curious item from my pack and place it on the table. But no sooner do I set it down than he ignores my plea and slides it out of the scabbard. I'm afraid now that he'll suddenly swipe it across my neck, plus it's a crime to expose a large knife in public for which I could be charged with a felony. I grow most pissed and wish to punch him out for this arrogant disrespect. I sit there in trembling repose, as he holds the knife in his feeble hands and closely examines the blade and hilt. I'm ready to scream, put the damn machete back in its sheath, what the fuck did I just tell you? It's all I can do to restrain outrage. Hmm, he muses, while turning the blade several times beneath his glare. This is a strange thing. I don't know what to make of it. Topaz finally replaces the machete into its sleeve and returns it to my hands. Desperate to bury it once more in my backpack, I then excuse myself, wishing never again to associate with this wingnut doofus. I have to get rid of this pronto, I later conclude on my way back to the hovel, where I stash the blade on the loft once more and figure out how to dispose of it, all the while hearing the demon's shrill laughter in the back of my troubled mind. You will never get rid of me for long. Someone else will find me, then hand me to another who brings it to another who is compelled without having a clue to bring it back into your presence, mocks the Sonoran imp. Remember, he who wields the hilt will slice you to bits and not even know why. Or remember. Rivulets of icy sweat run down my temples and cheeks as I attempt to figure out how to defeat this monster. Dusk falls, and I sit in my room, alone with the machete and still undecided how to dispose of it, or perhaps him. Then around 8 p.m. someone buzzes my hovel. It's Roman, burly dude, straight out of the Michigan woods, six foot two, scary dude, no doubt. Arrived in San Francisco about four years ago, a tentative friend at best, definitely heterosexual, like many infiltrators of the Castro who feign gay friendly. So I tell him to wait by the bus stop. I have something to show him. I run down the stairway with machete in hand and open the gate to speak with him on the sidewalk. What do you think of this, Roman? Don presented this to me last night, but I think I should get rid of it ASAP. Roman examines the hilt and scabbard, then removes the blade from its sheath for closer examination. He then looks up at me with trepidation. Yes, get rid of it right away. It's a sacrificial knife that has killed many people. Well, could you please get rid of it for me? Break it up in pieces first and dispose of it in separate trash cans, I request. So, Roman departs with a satanic weapon, which fortunately I never see again. 
though I really have no idea whether he really shattered the knife and trashed it in various garbage receptacles. As far as I know, he might have sold it for a tidy profit, in which case the machete will find its way back to me on some dark day. Several weeks later, I cross paths with Roman and ask him about that machete. All he says is, I got rid of it, but does not elucidate as to exactly how. I still see Roman from time to time, after all these years, usually to purchase some high-grade ganja, and I wonder, should I ask him about the devil's knife one more time, or should I keep my mouth shut? I still have occasional nightmares about pieces of a fragmented machete being drawn back together through some sort of dark bruja magic to reform themselves into a whole and hunt me down through the hands of naive mensajeros. Whatever that means. M-E-N-S-A-H-E. Sorry, A-J-E-R-O-S. <coughs> and that was a story titled The Screaming Machete by Ezekiel J. Kralin. Okay. <laughs> 